Safe City Community Meeting. We call this meeting due to the recent uptick in shootings in our community and due to the recent tragic murder of a young man, Xavier Louis Jacques. Tonight, we're gonna to be hearing from our Cambridge Police Department, from our Middlesex County District Attorney, Marion Ryan, and from our city manager, Louis de Pasquale. We're gonna get a sense of having the city and the county's response to these incidents. And more broadly, we're going to continue to have this conversation in the context of how can we continue to work together to make our community safe for everyone. I just want to note a few things. I want to note that our mayor, Sambal Siddiqui, is not going to be, be able to join us tonight. She chairs the school committee. They meet on Tuesdays. They have an extraordinarily important meeting, but she does have staff present and she does want to give her, her um, regards and apologies for not being able to be with us this evening. We do have with us also this evening our Vice Mayor, Mayor Vice Mayor uh, Alana Mallon, City Council Mark McGovern, and City Council uh, Sabrina Wheeler are in attendance with us this evening. I also want to note we usually have this meeting in the community or in the City Hall, but as you know, with COVID still raging in so many ways, we could not have this meeting in person. It's not the preferred way to do it. We're kind of forced to compromise by holding a meeting via Zoom. We thought it was important to have the meeting, to have a discussion, to let people, give people as much information as we possibly can, and also know ways to contact us if they have any questions. We're going to be recording this meeting. So for those of you that come in late or have to leave early, you'll be able to see this recap on the city web website, we will make it available for you. I also want to stress that it is not the first of our community meetings we've held. It will not be the last. So to those who are unable to join, please know that you're going to have an opportunity to see uh, this meeting, but also to go to other safe street meetings, safe streets, safe community meetings. We try as often as possible to have them uh, in the evening so people can attend. We also have these meetings starting usually as early as March so that we can have ourselves prepared for what may be happening in the summer. We really want to be proactive and not reactive. I want to take a moment just to talk about the flow of tonight's meeting. In a moment, you're going to hear from our city manager, Louis D. Basquale. After you hear from our city manager, you'll hear from our commissioner, Brandville Bard who will be followed by District Attorney Marion Ryan. And I want to particularly uh, thank uh, District Attorney Marion Ryan, Ryan for taking time out of her schedule on kind of short notice, but this is what our District Attorney does. When she, we call her, she always makes us a priority to get to our city, to talk to our citizens. Again, this is not the normal way we, we do things. It's not an in-person meeting. We, so we're going to ask people when you make your questions, you'll put your questions into the chat. And since this is a virtual meeting space, I will be reading the questions out to, I'm going to call our panelists, the commissioner, Commissioner Bride, Louis de Pasquale, or our district attorney, Marion Ryan, or other people that we might have in the room that we might, have call, we might want to call on if the question suggests that. Because I do believe we do have some people from the Housing Authority with us as well. I'm going to go through the question as time is allowed, but if the question is off topic, we may not be answering it. But please know that I will write, read out as many of the on topic questions as I can uh, in the second half of the meeting. I want to make sure that you understand that the Q&A <coughs> is a box, so we will not be enabling all the aspects. I also want to uh, stress because of the pandemic, we all have been cooped up in our homes for over a year. Some of us have lost our jobs. Some of us have lost loved ones. And almost all of us have had some sense of isolation and unease. People are sad. They're frustrated. And everyone is on a bit of a short fuse. This is understandable. But we don't want anyone, and we do not believe that gives anyone the right to act out in violence. There is no justification for taking another person's life 
or for engaging in behavior that can jeopardize the lives and safety of our neighbors. We cannot, we cannot accept, tolerate, or allow any kind of violence, even when we see, particularly the violence that we have been able to see over percolating over the past few weeks, that cannot become our new normal. Having said that, I want to give as much time to our city manager, our commissioner, and our district attorney, and more so, I want to be able to give a lot of time, ample time, to you, our community. So first of all, thank you for joining us this evening, and I'm now going to turn it over to our city manager, Louis De Pasquale. He will be followed by our commissioner, Randville Barr, and then we'll hear from our district attorney, Marion Ryan. Mr. De Pasquale. Thank you, and thank you for being here tonight. And I wanna thank Councilor Simmons and her staff and the Cambridge Police Department for organizing this meeting. I also wanna thank District Attorney Marion Ryan for joining us. Middlesex County District Attorney's Office has been a close partner with the city. And I wanted to express my gratitude for their continued collaboration. It is difficult to process a tragic loss of life in our city, especially when it involves gun violence and especially when it's someone so young. To Xavier's family and loved ones into the CRLS community, you have my deepest condolences. I am here tonight to listen and to assure you that the city is committed to doing everything to support the investigation into the fatal shooting of Xavier and to support his family who are grieving of the loss of this young man. The city is also here to support the neighborhood. I believe that it is critical for us to hear our residents' concerns and feedback. I know residents are concerned about why this happened and what we are going to do about it. I want to stress that the Cambridge Police Department has my full support in ensuring that they have the resources needed to keep our community safe. I want to thank the Cambridge Police Department from the patrol officers to the commissioner for their dedication and professionalism. From the initial response and community notifications to their work with the family, support of the vigil and the dedication to the investigation, the Cambridge the Police Department has been exceptional. And again, I wanna thank DA Ryan for her partnership and responsiveness to this investigation. As a city, we will continue working together until ultimately someone is brought to justice. We owe this to Xavier's family, his loved ones in the Cambridge community. Please know that we are here for you now and we will be here for you in the long term as well. Thank you for allowing me to say a few words tonight, and I will now turn it over to Commissioner Bob. Good evening, everyone. I'll, I'll start by um, you know offering my condolences for the loss of uh, Xavier. Um, I know that, um, and we here at the police department know that these incidents, you know, tear at the fabric of the community, but, you know, I'm also here to reassure you that these incidents are the exception and not the norm and that you live in a relatively safe city. I'm joined today here by uh, Superintendent Elo and Superintendent DePietro. Superintendent Elo runs support services and Superintendent DePietro runs operation, which is uniform services. Um, I'm going to immediately just introduce the district attorney and, uh, Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan, her office um, by statute oversees all death investigations and we work hand in hand with um, the district attorney, her staff, the state police in investigating all uh, death investigations. So I'm gonna turn it over to her and then I'll take it back, uh, make some brief comments and then we'll open it up for questions. So, um, Madam DA. Thank you, Commissioner. I echo the comments of the city manager and the commissioner in thanking you for being here tonight. And we understand, and that's why, as Councilor Simmons said, we were all made ready to be here tonight because we understand how these things affect a community. The commissioner is right. For a city of its size, Cambridge is a relatively safe city. These things are relatively rare, but that doesn't make them less frightening. And we've seen over the weeks since this happened, all of the memorials that have told us a little bit about Xavier, about what a wonderful son he was, family member, a friend and a student. And 
when we do these investigations, we are looking to find out what happened and to hold somebody accountable. But we never lose sight of the fact that no matter how well that investigation goes, we cannot repair that loss. And we, every one of us, whether we have children that age ourselves or have been in the community know that as we're going forward with the investigation. So taking that into consideration and thinking about how we do this, as the commissioner said, a death investigation is done collaboratively between my office, the Cambridge Police Department and the state police. And I'm gonna start by just talking a little bit about what we do know to this point, because sometimes just having the facts makes it easier to frame the questions and to think about where we are. What we know is that about 1240 in the morning on March 27th, a man and a woman who were driving in the area of Pemberton Street saw Xavier unresponsive and apparently unconscious on the street. They were the ones who first made the call to 911. The Cambridge police and EMTs and all of the first responders got there, discovered that he was suffering from gunshot wounds. They treated him on the scene and then took him to Mount Auburn Hospital where he was later, unfortunately, did not survive those injuries. And Xavier had been found in the area of the Ringe baseball field and next to his car which was a white Lexus sedan. He was located on the street under a street light, which was working and which was on. So think about that first in terms of where we are in what happened here. We also know that the car was locked and Xavier had on him his watch, his car keys, his wallet and money. So while we can't say definitively at this point that robbery couldn't have been a motive and it was unsuccessful, seems unlikely because everything was there with him. We also are aware that it's been reported in the media that there might have been some kind of a deal about selling sneakers. And we are working on that information, but at this point we have nothing that we can either confirm or rule out that that could not have been part of the motive. In the meantime, the Office of the Medical Examiner conducted an autopsy on Xavier and determined that there had been multiple gunshot wounds. So at this point, we know robbery probably is not a motive, that it's happening. Whoever did this is pretty brazen and happened right under a street light, right in the middle of the street, that he suffered multiple gunshot wounds and was left there only to be discovered by these passerbys. And we've been pursuing every lead since that time. Um, police officers have canvassed the neighborhood, conducted lots of interviews. As you know, the city of Cam Cambridge does not have city cameras. We have been able to locate a little bit of video, privately owned video. And we've been reviewing that and analyzing that to determine if there's any information that we can use from that. We're still at the stage where we haven't developed enough information from those videos to be making them available. There is, for instance, no particular car or information we have that we're now saying, please help us with that. Um, we did immediately after the shooting issue a request for the public's help. We have fortunately, and I really commend the community because every one of us knows, the commissioner and I are well aware of why it is difficult for people to come forward. Why it's hard to put yourself in the middle of this kind of an investigation, particularly if there are individuals that you might know or a neighborhood you live in. But to the community's credit, we've received a number of tips. We've been working through that. Um, we have made significant progress, particularly over the last 48 hours in terms of the information that we've been working on. And we're really asking people at this point to think a little bit more broadly. You might not have been right at that spot at that time, but think, if you know the time now, 1240 in the morning, think in the time before the time after in an area further from the fields where you might have seen someone or something that in and of itself didn't seem terribly significant, but it was a little bit off. 
what we tell people all the time and when people say, how long do you think it will take you to get to the end of the investigation, whether we are very close or very far, we never know what that one piece of information that somebody might have, somebody coming home after an evening out, somebody getting coming home from work, doing whatever might have seen something that they thought odd, but didn't ascribe too much to it. And it was two blocks away. Well, giving us that information might be enough to get us to the point of being able to identify who is responsible. So with that background of just what the facts are, I'm gonna turn it back to the commissioner and I'll be happy to take questions about the investigation when we reach that point. So commissioner. Thank you, Madam District. Commissioner, just before you start, if folks wanna start sending their questions that they may have, please feel free to send questions through now. And as soon as our speakers, our panelists are finished speaking, we'll go to those questions. Mr. Commissioner, please. Thank you, Madam District Attorney and Councilor Simmons. Look, we've been working tirelessly on this investigation um, from, from the onset. Um, as the District Attorney noted, we've got several solid leads, but we still need more information. and. You never know, as the district attorney mentioned, how that one piece of information, that one extra video can help us weave together a picture from uh, a bunch of different individual pieces of information and video to help us put a clear picture together of uh, what actually occurred. So we're gonna ask for your continued support and help. We got some, but we need some more and we need any information you you have. When you this are trying to make that decision as to whether or not you want to come forward and avail video that you might have on your ring or your nest video, just remember in it like this, murderers don't deserve sh your shelter. They don't deserve um, any leeway to so come forward, give us that information that you have and help us to bring, you know, hold somebody accountable. Um, we, we have our best and brightest assigned to the case. Um, it, we know what it doesn't appear to be, but we don't, you know, have a complete picture. It's not quite a whodunit, but um, we we need more information to tie everything together. So I'm begging for your help. I'm begging for you to uh, come forward with anything that you might think. Let us determine whether it's relevant or not. Just any piece of information that you have. Um, the district attorney hinted to the fact that it, this, this might as well have occurred in broad daylight. It was such a well lit section of Pemberton Street there in between the, the courts that it, it was brazen. So um, these individuals do not deserve shelter. Please provide us any information that you have and help us um, hold these individuals accountable for the harm that they've done to the community. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Councillor Simmons and ask her to um, start filtering us the questions and um, we'll do our best to provide uh, as much information as possible. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Our, and, and to um, our district attorney and to the uh, city manager, uh, before I just open up the floor for questions, I do want to acknowledge, um, I did just have an opportunity to speak to Rachelle McCann. She is uh, on the call and I just wanted to uh, say to her from all of us that uh, we send our sincerest sympathies and condolences to her and her family. And as I've said to her in private, and I would say now in public, she need only to reach out to us. We are here for her and her family. And uh, she didn't have to come. She wanted to come. I just want to thank her for, uh, for being here because that takes a great deal of, of character and strength. Uh, and I understand that. So thank you, uh, Rachel. Uh, one of the questions um, to the commissioner says, how can people, you said, please give us a call or please contact us. Is there a particular number uh, or way that people can contact? How should they get in touch? So I'm going to ask um, my public information officer to put our contact information in the chat so that you can just get us directly on our anonymous lines and, and through any of our social media platforms, but through um, our business line is the most common way that we're reached. That's 617-349-3300. Thank you, thank you. Uh, another question that is in the chat is, what steps are the city and the CPD doing to tamp down on the violence as we approach warmer weather? 
uh, typically we do see more violence during the summer months. And is there, there seems to be a fear in the community that we might see even more <clears throat> violence due to people being stuck in quarantine for the past year. Uh, would one of you like to address that question? <clears throat> so um, here, here's the thing, the, the perception and reality sometimes are different. We, we had, we went through the pandemic last year with zero shooting victims. Shootings are a rare occurrence in the city. Um, when they do happen, they, they rip us apart. They, and they tear at the fact, particularly when there's, there's a murder. I mean, nothing, you know, creates that fear of, uh, you know, unsafety more than, you know, gunfire ripping through a community. Um, so yeah, I, I get it. But the fact of the matter is that we've had just a handful of shooting incidents this year. One prior shooting victim that's completely unrelated um, to this incident. And then one, one discharge of a weapon with no shooting victim. This incident is isolated, doesn't appear to be connected to anything else um, right now. I've heard rumors about an increase in graffiti and most of the incidents of graffiti that are reported to us aren't new incidents of graffiti. Um, incident, in, individuals may be noticing them now, but we've taken notice and removed where we could with, uh, in conjunction with our public works department, um, the graffiti, but most of the incidents of graffiti that we're being brought to our attention aren't new graffiti. So the perception and the reality aren't always, you know, there's some dissonance there sometimes, but this is a safe city. Um, our numbers are, you know, historically low. Uh, once again, I, I would never make light of a murder. I mean, my Xavier was loved. Um, many in my department, you know, it cut them to the core because they, they in fact felt strongly about Xavier. But we haven't had a firearm, a gun homicide in more than three years. So Cambridge is a safe city. Um, but once again, that that brings us very little solace as we're trying to hold Xavier's killers accountable. Thank you. Dave. Another question uh, to uh, the district attorney, Ms. Ms. Ryan, if people want to give tips directly to the DA's office, how can they forward that information in a way that they can be certain that they are anonymous? No, we'll do the same thing. We'll put our contact information in there. As I said earlier, we understand people's fear and we will make whatever accommodation we need to do to, to protect people who wanna give us information. As the commissioner said, people who've committed a murder don't deserve to be protected, but people fear getting into the middle of that. And we have the ability to offer, if somebody does become known, to offer relocation, to offer whatever, is needed to do that. And we certainly will not hesitate to do that when it comes to a homicide case. Thank you, thank you. Another question in the chat. There continues to be reference to individuals. Is there something to indicate multiple firearms or multiple suspects? Is there any reason to suggest that there might be group violence by which I mean violence driven by street groups? I'll, I'll take that. No, I, it's just a vernacular that I'm using. And when I say individuals, I'm using it in, in the general sense that individuals who commit murder, whether it was one in, individual in this incident or um, individuals, they don't deserve shelter and they need to be held accountable. And we need you, the community, to assist us in doing that, always. Thank you, Commissioner. One other question, and this is for the city manager. In years past, the council passed an order asking for proactive steps to prevent violence, to have more programs, programming in public areas, parks, et cetera, throughout the summer months. How is COVID impacting our ability to go, to go ahead and do that for this summer? Mr. City Manager. So that, that's a great question. Uh, we hope that we would be open up a little more this summer than we have in the past as the COVID uh, seems to be better under control with the vaccines. And, you know, we will work closely with human services and the police department and other agencies to make sure that we are providing those activities. But I do think, you know, we'll, there'll be, you'll, you'll still need to wear masks, but uh, the way we're looking at it now, the parks will be a lot more open this year than they were last year as we continue to make progress 
obviously we'll, we'll follow the governor's guidelines as well, but I think we'll, we have having the discussion, we'll continue to have the discussions of what we can do in our parks uh, with the police department, with the human services department, with the health alliance in terms of providing activity. So we are in a little better place this year in terms of getting outside. I had a meeting with human services today about that in general, providing those services than we would have been last year. I'll, uh, I'll jump on to that as well. And then I'll ask um, Superintendent Elo to discuss some violence prevention initiatives that we have at the department. But last year, um, during the height of COVID, we were able to partner with My Brother's Keeper, um, the Department of Human Service Programs and the, the parks and put, in a, put together a program in conjunction with the mayor's summer employment program for um, some of our most vulnerable individuals, some of our most at risk uh, young people, men and boys and girls. And um, we did it in a socially distance, distance fashion. We called it the summer empowerment program and it was a, a, a huge success and it kept some young folks out of trouble and, um, and, and, you know, and gave them some very necessary life skills. So um, we're gonna look to replicate that this summer and it can, in addition to the plethora of other programs that the city normally runs during uh, our summertime. Superintendent Elo. All right, thank All right. you. And I will say that throughout COVID, we have very much been involved in our prevention, early intervention programs when it comes to our at-risk youth. Uh, we're focusing on uh, you know, prevention of any sort of violence. So we're in you know, consultation with um, community groups, with neighboring agencies, um, to really figure out what we need to do to provide support to keep young people out of trouble. Uh, we still have a, we have our focused deterrence program that has been, you know, involved through, throughout COVID. We're reaching out to, you know, young people who are at risk, providing them in their family, connecting them to services. We have a clinical support unit that's very active, reaching out to young people again who are at risk and providing them with services. We uh, hired a, a worker through ROCA. ROCA is an outreach program that focuses on at-risk teens. That we, we have weekly meetings uh, with the outreach worker and she is following up on any sort of at-risk individual. So I just wanna say we are heavily involved with our at-risk young people doing what we can to prevent violence. And we're intervening early uh, whenever we get some information on that. Thank you. Thank you. The commission, I want to mention MBK myself because I literally had a call with someone today about what we'd be looking for them to do this year. So those discussions are already happening. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Seaman. I do want to recognize, uh, I see on the chat, Tony Clark. Uh, as we were putting this together, I had gotten an email from Tony Clark asking, was there a community meeting? So yeah, brilliant minds, you know, or concerned minds think alike. So I do appreciate that e email from Tony and the work that he's been doing himself uh, through MBK and um, other programs that are there to empower our black men in particular. Uh, from Rochelle McCants, uh, she, she offered this in the chat. And for people that want to ask a question, it's actually not in the ch chat, you have to go to the Q&A. And I think I missed, might've misled a few people. So it's go into the Q&A and your question will be populated and I will read it. It says, Xavier was not affiliated with any gang. How does graffiti have to do with his debt, death? I don't understand the connection. Uh, Commissioner, you want to try to address that? I may, I think maybe there was some some misconception there, but I don't want to speak for you, and certainly don't want to speak for Miss McCann. So yes, I'm just sure. and, and and I can't stress how sorry I am for your loss, Mom, Miss um, McCants. So no, it doesn't. People were conflating um, the fact that there's been an increase in, in graffiti with. Um, the tragic incident that, of your son's death. So it has nothing to do with um, your son's death. I, I was just trying to dispel or disabuse folks of that notion um, with my comment, not to not to mean that it was connected in any way, shape or form. And thank you. Those of us that, uh, my daughter Jada Simmons, an anonymous who knew Xavier very, very well through the Gately and the after school program often said what kind of a young man he was. And, you know, he is what, what, what I know of him through her speaks of, you know, this is the, what, the, what kind of son you want you, your young man child to grow up to be. So uh, again, I would reiterate, um, I know in the community knows, I certainly believe the community knows what kind of young man 
he was and how well he was raised by you, Miss McCann. So uh, again, you have our support about us dispelling any myths that might be uh, out there in the community. And I, I can't stress how, how well he was thought of. I can't stress it enough by members of the police department. So, um, you know, once again, forgive me if, if it appeared that I was making that connection because I certainly was not. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Ms. McCann, for that question. Uh, we now have another question. This is, how does Cambridge collaborate with initiatives around gun violence with Boston or other re regional responses and nonprofits? Superintendent, you want to follow up with that one? Sure. I mean, the, the collaboration is ongoing and constant, even with ROCA. That's something that goes through Boston, through Chelsea, um, just communicating about at-risk youth that, you know, go you go across borders, go into neighboring uh, communities. We're constantly in communication uh, with police departments and other outreach workers, sharing information on what people are doing, where people are going, and actively following up. Again, and our, and our goal is really to offer assistance. We want to prevent violence, um, and, and that's really what we're doing, is how do we bring all the resources to bear uh, and reach out to communities and reach out to at-risk you know, individuals and their families, saying, how do we stop violence? Um, and we're sharing information that daily. Yeah. As much as we like to think that we're insulated, we, we know in reality that we're not and violence doesn't stop at our borders. So we, we stay in constant communication with our regional partners. Um, Superintendent Elo mentioned ROCA, which is a program whose mission is to stop the poverty to prison um, cycle. And so we, we, we continually try to stay out in front of, and we, we act as, as much as we can agents of prevention not, you know, we, we think we're, we're judged more by the absence of violence and crime than we are uh, uh, about our visible response to crime. So um, we know that we're not insulated and that um, violence will come in. So we take proactive steps to help address it in advance of it. Thank you. Um, Another concern that has been raised in the Q&A is uh, that this area of Pemberton is a highly utilized area throughout the day in the evening with the parks, the tot lots, the community gardens, the tennis courts, basketball courts, baseball field, and dog run. What consideration is being given to ensuring this is a safe area for recreation? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Madam Counselor, you said what consideration is being given? given? Yes. So I didn't hear the rest of it. Okay, let me just bring that question back up. It says, I actually can't find it, I've lost it. I believe what the, the person was asking is what, because this is a, such a well-used area, um, what kind of consideration, right, here's the question, the area of Pemberton is a highly utilized area throughout the day and the evening. They have the parks, they have the tot lots, they have the community gardens, the tennis courts, the basketball courts, the baseball field and the dog run. What consideration is being given to ensuring that this area is safe for recreation? So uh, thanks for the question. And I just wanna take the time to reiterate and, and point out again that all street lights working, well lit and I, you know, I'm out there moments after the, uh, the discovery of Xavier's body. And it might as well have been broad daylight, how well lit it was. Mm -hmm. um, we, we understand that it's a well-traveled area. Um, one of the considerations that as a city, we need to decide um, in, is if we want to, and it would just serve as a deterrent. It wouldn't necessarily prevent these uh, incidents from occurring, but deciding whether we want to um, put cameras on our ingress and egress to public parks and our uh, public facilities, but that ultimately would have to be a decision that the council would, would have to agree to because of our newly promulgated surveillance ordinance. So um, that's all the considerations that we need to, as a city and as a community, determine whether we think it's best for safety, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have, a, it wouldn't have prevented this uh, tragic incident. It would, it would have helped as an investigatory tool afterwards and may have served as a deterrent. 
just to go back to what I mentioned earlier, what the commissioner said as to the brazenness of this, you know, since January of 2019, there have only been three homicides in Cambridge. And one of the other ones happened in a very similar circumstance right under a streetlight in Danahee Park. Again, we were out there that night. It literally was lit up like daytime. So when, and I think that also goes to, in thinking about holding somebody accountable, you know, for Xavier's family, that this is a small comfort. But in terms of what people are not only attacking the person they're injuring, they really are attacking the community. These are places, Danahee Park, Pemberton, they are places where every resident deserves to be able to feel safe. And when something like this happens, you know, we've all suffered a lot this year in terms of what we've lost out on, but they take something else away from you. They take away your feeling of being safe in public recreation spaces. And that's wrong as well. So in terms of when, you know, it's why we encourage people to try to give us what they know to help us to get hold these people accountable because they took obviously the most precious thing, a child from Xavier's family, but they took a modicum of safety from everybody who uses that area because they are well used areas. Uh, thank you, Madam District Attorney. One of the questions, uh, and we don't have anyone from um, our schools with us in part because of the school committee meeting, but um, there is a question about what are we doing for some of the students um, around mental health supports. I know, I think uh, Ellen Semenoff is on the call. I don't know if she wants to or can add something, but there is some concern is how are we holding the community together from a mental health uh, perspective? I just want to point out, and I know Superintendent Ela wants to address this, what a concern this is. The school was very good in terms of coming in right away and offering services, but we have seen across the county and across the state, and as recently as this morning, if you read the Boston Globe, we are now seeing teenagers, young adolescents who are suffering from some very severe mental health issues. And maybe it's due to the pandemic, maybe it's loss of other things, but the tragedy in this is we are often seeing those young people who are brave enough, and it takes great bravery to say, I need help, going to the hospital and spending 48 to 51 hours in the emergency. The emergency room is not designed to treat a mental health crisis. And this is a, a conversation for another day, but we need to be much more aggressive about this because those young people, assuming they survive the crisis, are going to be tomorrow's adults and they have really suffered. And we are seeing it in terms of their acting out behavior in some cases, and that's trauma that they're gonna carry forward. And it's much cheaper, as expensive as it is, it's cheaper to address it now than mm -hmm. to wait 10 years and see it on the street. Uh, thank you, uh, District Attorney Ryan. It does come up to another question that's very similar, which is even though we don't know what has happened yet, what messages should parents be giving their children? So I guess the broader question is not only what supports, and maybe this is something that the council, and I know a number of my council colleagues are on this call, should be paying some more attention to around what kind of wraparound support can we put around our communities? Not only Ms. McCann and her family personally, but the, the community of North Cambridge, the, the high school community, uh, and how do parents, uh, navigate this level of stress. You know, it, you're right. We are, we're, we lived, we've been living in the midst of a COVID world for longer than any one of us thought we'd be able to endure. And now we have this horrific injury to our city's family, to the fabric of our city, to the fabric of our security. So what do um, families do? I see Superintendent Elo, you put your hand up. 
Or was that by accident? I did, no. Just as a parent of two 15-year-old boys, um, you know, I recently had to take my son, I was concerned about his emotional well-being, to the hospital, to his primary care, just to say, is everything okay? So I would say, stay in touch with the primary care. Mm -hmm. Talking to Dr. Jamie Barrett, who's our clinic, head of our clinical support unit, he is anticipating and we're seeing an uptick in, in young people that are in crisis. This is a very difficult time for teenagers. So I would ask parents to be plugged in with your children, have those conversations with them. And if you're concerned, because it is a, there is a tax on our mental health services, go to your primary care and get some, some support um, through, through there, that they are at least available. Um, and Dr. Barrett, through the Cambridge Police Department, we're doing everything we can to reach out and identify families in need our youth resource officers, again, they're, they're available. They're reaching out to the schools and to the human services to figure out what they can do to help support families. But the Cambridge Police Department, uh, the Cambridge Health Alliance, we are all here to support you. Just let us know what you need and we'll do what we can to connect you to services. I think another- and I just wanna stress that while most of the services are not in person, they still exist. They're, they're just taking the teleformat. So they're telecounseling, teleclinical services, and they're, they're effective and they have been effective and we've been utilizing them heavily throughout the entire pandemic. I'm sorry, and I, I, I think to the extent that we're here tonight and we're talking about the impact on the community, we're adults and we're having this conversation. People forget how deeply these kind of things traumatize kids. I would guess that the majority of us on this call are at an age where we remember losing somebody of our age when we were in high school. You never forget that. And especially when it happens in this kind of a violent episode. And we forget the kids who already feel like they've lost a lot. If we're worried about our safety in the community, they're not gonna say that, especially young men. They're not gonna say, I feel scared walking down the street. But if somebody like Xavier, who was such a standout in so many ways, this happens to him, they're worried about themselves. So as parents, one thing to do is just don't hope they don't know about it or they're not thinking about it. You know, maybe in a parallel activity when you're driving or something, just bring that up. Talk about, be vulnerable yourself. Talk about how you feel like, you know, you can't use the park. We always see after this, kids are a little bit more reluctant to go play basketball. They don't know what's going to happen to them. And sometimes we just don't confront that as well as we should. I, 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 would, I would just add that one of the strengths of Cambridge is our ability to work together, our police department, our human services department, but our health department. And they're involved. And I think there's some people from the health department on the call here tonight, but they're a key part of this. And we need to make sure that that information is out there and available because they have been great partners when we've needed them in, in tragedies like this. We have Alicia Barrows and she did have a comment in the chat. Alicia, do you wanna speak a little bit about what, what's happening uh, at Riverside? Alicia? Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm, my name is Alicia Barrows. I'm safety specialist um, at Cambridge Public Schools. And uh, immediately when an incident like this does take place, we have support the next day, first thing in the morning. Um, we realize this is a very tough time for kids. Our department is doing uh, many wellness checks on students who are not engaging uh, remotely. Um, we go to their homes, make sure that they're okay. Make first, first, make sure if they're okay. Second, make sure if they need any support, we're there for them. Um, sometimes it's just nice to see, see a friendly face that they haven't seen in over a year. Um, our department is really focusing on moving forward social and emotional needs. I mean, policing the hallways, that's over. These kids need us more social and emotional level. Um, and and our, I feel like our department is definitely focusing on that. But the school department reacts so fast with an incident like this, knowing that this is extremely overwhelming for kids. Um, we have the, the art team right on site for, for staff and students. Uh, so we offer support immediately following an incident like this and know how important it is to, to help kids out with, when something like this happens. Um, just on a personal level, I knew Xavier. Um, I read just, just mom's on, so I just wanna just tell a quick story about him. He, he got kicked out of class a couple times and he always used to say, him and I became friends. He always said, I want the girl security guy with the pretty eyes to come and get me. I mean, that was him, that was Xavier. 
Um, and him and I just really clicked. And Ms. McCants, I went, I went to school with you as I sent you a message. I'm extremely sorry about your loss. And I know how hard this must be, but we are here to support our youth, so. Thanks so much, Alicia. And, and Ellen, we did kind of call, call you a little off guard, but please, I mean, you've done a lot of work with through DHSP, particularly when it comes to outreach to neighborhoods. Can you just kind of talk us a little bit, a little bit about some of the neighborhood outreach and what's going on? Sure. And I also, as you said, I also want to give some credit um, to Tony Clark, who's on here, who hosted a meeting the other night to do some of the same conversation about the ways in which we can do um, more connection. I wanted to also um, pick up on something that the district attorney said about the um, real paucity of um, uh, services right now um, for young people who need hospitalization and how incredibly challenging that is. I wanna say one small bright spot coming, um, which um, the city manager is aware of, is expansion of both adolescent and child um, beds um, through the Cambridge Health Alliance over at the Somerville Hospital campus. That work is ongoing right now. Mm -hmm. And the expansion of the child beds will be concluded, I believe, in June. And by December, the expansion of adolescent beds, because as um, District Attorney Ryan said, the number of children who are and and adolescents who end up being held for days in emergency rooms, um, which is a terrible place for anybody to be spending time, but that really is a crisis. I also want to say that um, I think, um, you know, Xavier had been a longtime member of the Gately Youth Center, and obviously the young people who knew him there, but the staff, as you said, um, um, staff in the police, the staff of the youth centers, we were fortunate, Riverside came in to actually work with our staff who were also deeply impacted this and the young people. I do think that um, the some of it in person, but a lot of it virtually, the connection to our teens who are deeply impacted by this um, is pretty critical. And I think you asked, someone asked a question earlier about um, summer um, and our ability to um, uh, be um, in person more. We will be, as you know, we run a, the large Mayor Summer Youth Employment Program and we will this summer be providing both in-person and virtual programming depending on both what young people want and what the sites are that they need. Um, and we expect to have um, programs operating out of the youth centers and out of many of the community programs, as well as with different employers throughout the city. Um, and the work that needs to happen in the summer, in the parks, because we know our young people will be there and will need our support. Uh, thanks, Ellen, thank you very much. Uh, there's another question, it says, uh, the city council has a public safety committee, who's the chair, and what are the top three priorities in our project related to community safety? Uh, Thank you for that question. The city council does a lot of its work in subcommittee meetings. One of the things uh, with the chair of uh, public safety is Quentin Gondovan. I couldn't speak to his priorities, but the other thing that relates to human services and public safety is um, our human service committee, which is chaired by uh, council Mark McGovern. He's been doing a lot around community outreach I chair the Civic Unity Committee, which talks about equity and fairness, and talk again talking about, you know, of empowering individuals, marginalized communities, and the elimination of, of racism. So each of us, each city councilor in our own way, uh, including our vice mayor, who's been very, very outspoken on fairness issues, take on bit, bits and pieces of not only public safety, but anti-racism, violence, all those, all those important issues to bring it back before the council to establish policy initiatives to protect our citizens. So I think that's a great question. The city council, I feel very comfortable speaking for the city council in this instance, that we all pull in the same direction when it comes to the safety of our neighborhood, <laughs> our families and our children. I think that's a great question and thank you for asking it. There was another question, um, relative to the CHA, and I think we've made Mike Johnson a panelist 
Uh, one of the questions are, is what is being done in regards to safety in the Cambridge Housing Authority? So uh, thanks, Mike, for joining us. Can you uh, talk to that a little bit for us? So um, the Housing Authority has a very good relationship with uh, the Cambridge Police Department. Um, we meet monthly. Our um, managers at the sites meet monthly with the Cambridge Police Department to talk about trouble spots, to talk about issues, um, to um, basically see if there's anything that we should know about or to let them know about anything that we've seen. Um, the Housing Authority also does um, lighting surveys throughout our entire portfolio. Um, I think you'll see Dave Degu, who's our, um, uh, our security administrator. I think he's on tonight also. Um, he actually goes around with our managers uh, you know, after dark to make sure everything is lit um, and everything is appropriate. Um, but I, I have to say, um, you know, for us, you know, the relationship that we have with the police department has just been um, incredibly valuable. Um, and uh, we've been able to deter a lot of issues before they become an issue. Uh, thanks. Uh, one question that s was sparked from the CAJ question, may, I don't know if it's specifically for you, for you Mr. Johnson, um, maybe more for the commissioner. Uh, this, this unfortunate shooting reminded a lot of folks and some people conflated what's happening in Somerville and at the Somerville housing development that I can't call by name right now. Uh, could someone speak and dispel or give some information? I'm not gonna say dispel any misinformation, but give some clear information about two things. One, what happened to uh, Xavier, was that related to what's happening in Somerville and what is going and what is happening around uh, the conflict that seems to exist between Somerville Somerville in Cambridge and uh, the, if DA Ryan wants to speak on that as well, that'd be important because that has come up a lot in just not only in the chat, but also in conversations among citizens that somehow believe or want to know, is there a connection uh, between the two? If not, is what happening? what is happening between Somerville North Cambridge and the port, is that gonna exacerbate what are we doing looking forward to the summer? So I open the floor up to uh, the police department to answer that to you, Commissioner or Superintendent Elo or Superintendent DePetro. So historically off and on, we've seen a, an, an ongoing tension between Mystic River, Mystic Park and some of our individuals from the port here. It's, um, it has nothing to do we have no information that it has anything to do with um, Xavier's death. So um, let me just dispel that right there. But um, yeah, historically there's been some tension. We stay in constant contact with um, Somerville police and um, all of our regional partners, because once again, um, what happens in the region affects everyone in the region. So we, we're not naive enough to think that we're insulated from it. And But there historically some tension between uh, young folks in the port and young folks in, in, in the mystic housing development. And a follow up, uh, is, is it young people or is it high school age group? Your question, Counselor, was is it young people at the high school age? It, is it young people or is it high school age youth? There's, there's some confusion it, around that. So I, I would say it's from late middle school all the way up to young adults. Okay, a DA. So let's, let's say 12 to 24 and up. Really? Anything you wanna add, um, Madam District Attorney? No, as the commissioner said there, we are concerned about what's been going on there. And we have been working very collaboratively with both Cambridge and Somerville to address that because we all share that concern. We don't want things to get any more heated during the summer than they have been. So we've been working very hard on that. We're going up for a grant appropriation uh, next week that directly allows us to address regional and ongoing violence. So, um, you know, we, we constantly go up for that grant quarterly and it's up next week. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam District Attorney. Uh, there's another question similar to, to a question asked earlier, but a little bit different, so I'm gonna ask it. There continues to be a reference to individuals 
is there something to indicate multiple firearms or multiple suspects? Is there any reason to suggest that there might be group violence, by which I mean violence driven by street groups? There's no, we don't have any information right now that would suggest that. We don't, there are pieces that we are missing, so we don't know where we'll get to with that, but we have no indication about that. You know, you have to think that when something happens in such a brazen way, somebody mm -hmm. left that area pretty quickly. It may, it certainly raises the specter is there somebody driving a car and somebody who's firing a gun, but we don't know that. Thank you. Anything you want to add, Commissioner? No, the district attorney covered it. Thank you. One other question we have uh, in the chat is, is the city doing anything different this year in terms of violence prevention, gun violence prevention, et cetera, from which has been done in previous years? It's a two-part question. And what metrics are being used to determine if we're being successful in this work? So I, I don't know that I would say that we're doing anything different. We perpetually are doing things aimed at um, preventing, eliminating, and reducing violence. I, I, you know, I can't reiterate enough that overall we live in a safe city. You're, you're in a city who has a 10-year average of approximately about 11 to 12 shooting victims a year. And the last three years going back, not including this year, we've had zero, one, and five. So we've been steadily cutting away at, at that number and been, and you know, that's one of the metrics of success, mm -hmm. um, how we're able to um, reduce gun violence. So I wouldn't say that we're doing anything differently, but we, we have been successful. And the commissioner is certainly right. I began my career in the Cambridge District Court. Mm -hmm. And I remember a day when there were any number of shooting incidents and shooting victims. And certainly over the last three years, that metric, which we track in terms of confirmed shots fired and then fatal and non-fatal injuries has fallen to a level that for a city the size and population of Cambridge is really pretty commendable. Thank you, Madam D District Attorney. Uh, this looks like it might be the last question. We're coming up on the hour and I'm gonna say two things. First of all, I don't want anyone to think this is a one and done item or moment. We will be having continued conversations in this way until we can get together in the chamber or other community venues to talk about the safety of our streets. So even though we close this meeting out, I want people to be assured that we will be coming back to talk to you in this venue or others to keep you informed as well as to hear from you our neighbors, our citizens, our friends, your families, so that you'll have the latest information. So um, it looks like it might be our last question is, anyone with information says, anyone with information contact the Middlesex District Attorney's uh, Office. And then it says, will CPD increase the police presence in the area during the times in which people frequently frequent the park? Evening hoops, dog walking, tennis playing. Can someone sure. speak? Yeah, we, we certainly will continue to do that. We, we've already increased our presence. You'll, you should see an influx of officers in both vehicles. Um, as the weather is broken, you'll see more bikes and you'll see officers even out on foot. So yeah, the answer in short is yes. Uh, thank you. So we are right up on the eight o'clock hour. Again, this was an opportunity to hear from people, what, hear from people from the city, there are schools, public safety, the manager's office, the district attorney's office, the school department on what was happening in terms of very specifically to the investigation relating to, to Xavier's uh, untimely death, but also to give you any other information that you were interested in knowing about here again, what's happening in Somerville or not happening in Somerville and what we continue uh, to, to see. So I, of course, when you say there's no more questions then another question comes in. So one more question, uh, it says, what can parents do to let the youth of Cambridge know that adults care, not just for our own kids, but for all youth? Um, I wanna just, who would like to, let me just start as a city councilor. 
to say that as a city council and as a policymaker, I assure you that my colleagues and I, from the mayor, Sambal Siddiqui, our vice mayor, Alana Mallon, and all of our membership are acutely concerned about our families. And we will do everything that we can do by making sure that we have the proper resources available through the CPD, through the Department of Human Services, through the Cambridge Health Alliance, to make sure we can keep our families whole, to hold them close and, and, and keep them whole. But in addition, would we, any of the member of the panelists like to speak to that? Well, one thing, Councillor, is I think, you know, Cambridge PD, as you've seen tonight, if across the 54 cities and towns in Middlesex County, Cambridge is one of the most innovative police departments. Um, they are wonderful partners. And, you know, maybe we need, we do another one of these and we give young people an opportunity to have that conversation with us. Um, and then it, they don't hear it secondhand. I'd certainly be happy to do that. I, I'm sure the other panelists would do that as well. And, you know, it's sometimes I think those concerns that people have, maybe they don't want to raise them if their parents are there and we could respond to them. I'd be happy to do that. Excellent, excellent to know. I'm also seeing from Jeremy from the Cambridge Police Department, if anyone wants to give a tip anonymously, you can text a tip to tip 650. That's text a tip to tip 650 and then begin their message. And then you'll be able to leave an anonymous message. So you have the information from our Cambridge Police Department if you'd want to call them directly. We also have in the chat, you wanna reach out anonymously to our district attorney, Marian Ryan, you can do that. You can always call directly to the city and the city manager's office or to the office of the city council. We wanna make as many opportunities for you, our residents, to be able to reach out, not only to give information, but to get information. When we work together, each one of us, we make the city a better place. So to our, our the people that tuned in this evening, I wanna thank you so much for tuning in. And please be checking your email and your text messages for the next Safe Streets, Safe Community meeting. I wanna thank our district attorney, Miriam Ryan, thank you. It, it's just amazing at a drop, a drop of a dime, I give you a call and you said, Denise, tell me where to be and you were here. So I can't say thank you enough. Well, thank you for including me. I'm happy to be here. Sorry thank we're talking about this, but happy to be here to answer the questions about it. Thank you. And to our Commissioner Bard, Superintendent Elo, Superintendent DiPietro, uh, Jeremy Warnick, you cannot see. Uh, thank you so much for helping us put this together and being a part of the conversation and being a part of the solution. To our city manager, Louis D. Pasquale, Ellen Seminoff, and others that I can't see in the background, I wanna thank them as well. Um, and Mike Johnston, thank you for just pitch hitting, just kind of jumping into the middle there and being a part of this panel uh, when you didn't expect it, but that's how you uh, work, which is always ready to be a part of this thing called the community called Cambridge. And to, again, to each of you viewing this evening, thank you for viewing in. I, I can't um, say enough to uh, Ms. McCant, our sincerest condolences. Um, to what your, you and your family are going through, but I cannot say enough or loud enough that you have us here by your side, not only now, but later on, when you're probably gonna need us the most. To that, I just wanna say good night, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and please stay in touch with us. We're gonna be looking to hear from you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.